Thank you, everyone. I call the April 10th, 2023 school board meeting to order. It is 6.02 p.m. when we are in conference room C of the Fisher Administration Building at 12121 West North Avenue. Ms. Summers, please call the roll. Ms. Newfeld. Here. Ms. Fraley. Here. Mr. Meyer. Here. Dr. Jessa Finger. Here. Dr. Hoyt. Here. Mr. Phillips. Here. Ms. Willis. Here. We begin with public comment and any non-agenda items this evening. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input and decision making. The board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual board member may respond on the issue or issues raised. However, it is not the intent of public comment portion of the agenda for the board to enter into a debate with a member or members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment regarding non-agenda items this evening. Do we have any non-agenda public comment in the room this evening? Yes. Please come up and introduce yourself and share your name and address. Um, my name is Tay Jackson Smith and I'm a Milwaukee resident. And um, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. I'm um, to the superintendent, to each and every one of you in your respective positions. So um, again, it is, it's not anything that's on the board but um, or agenda. But my question is um, with your staff. I've had a couple concerns issues with the staff in, in Tulsa. Um, one of your staff members said to an African-American child, I'm a big ugly guy who came to strip you of your spirit and tear your soul down. Before it can even be addressed, he, he resigned himself. And so that's an issue because it was intimidating, it was threatening, it was bullying, and it also was traumatizing to the child. Also, I had another concern with a staff member at Tulsa who showed partiality to an African-American child. Um, they allowed the Caucasian children to work on the computer, to be able to um, do whatever it was that they were assigned to do, but then told the African-American children that you need to work on um, using paperwork. And so when you show impartiality, when you're bullying, when you're threatening, when you're intimidating African-Americans, it makes it hard for them to learn. It makes them hard for them to even adjust to coming to Tulsa to learn. And so that's a very big concern of mine. My concern is what is being done? That's, that's one of my concerns. My next thing that I wanted to make mention to is when it comes to um, the staff at Tulsa, I've heard a lot of the children, I heard a lot of from different children that um, the staff at Tulsa treats African-Americans a certain different type of way, meaning not only are they showing partiality, but they're making them feel that they're that they're being discriminated against. I've heard from the community from previous meetings that it's African-Americans that's bringing the test scores down. It's African-Americans that are um, bullying and African-Americans that are causing a lot of trauma and a lot of um, issues in Tulsa. But in reality, um, there's two sides to it. When the students are coming there to learn, one, when your staff is being tra traumatizing them, what type of trainings are do your staff have? Are they trained in trauma-based when it comes to children of different nationalities? Is there something in place that um, that your staff is going to different trainings for? That's a question that I have. And also, the effects that's traumatizing the children. The children are afraid to even come. Children are afraid to even voice their opinions. And so I just want to know those are some things that I have just briefly that I wanted to put out here. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Joseph Anger, I'll make sure that staff follows up with that parent. Thank you. Yeah. Not only is she a Milwaukee resident, but more importantly, she's a, a parent, parent in the district. Yeah. So thank you for your comments. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Laura Ryan, 309 North 69th Street. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Mewfeld, Ms. Fraley, and Mr. Phillips for your service to the board. Um, very appreciated. Ms. Mewfeld, it's been a long, long time, so congratulations, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Jamie, do we have any comment online tonight? No, there are no hands raised. Thank you. We will move into our consent agenda.
Um, are there any items on the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion and action? Seeing none, may have a motion to approve the consent agenda. It is recommended that the school board approve the consent agenda and I so move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any board discussion? Um, I just want to call out whenever we see resignations on the part of teachers and school staff, it's, it's always hard for me um, just because I always wonder, like, are they going to another school district? Are they, you know, completing their service as a, as a teacher? Because a resignation to me is different than a retirement. Um, and so I, I, I just want to put out there to, to teachers. Um, there were there were a couple names I saw on this list that made me very sad. Um, and that uh, I hope that when folks resign, they are providing us with feedback um, as to, you know, why you're leaving, what we can be doing better, what we're doing well that you hope we continue doing, et cetera. Um, because again, I, I hope that if one thing has been clear about my service, it's that teachers are what make this district what it is. So um, I'm not gonna name names, but you know who you are. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, we can continue to do all we can to retain our really high performing, well-loved staff. Mr. Meyer. I ask forgiveness. I will. They're all important. Yeah. But Jean Beeble has been like an all star and among all stars. So um, you, I, I just want to say particularly that I remember the curriculum presentations that you led. And I, well, I say thank you. I'll second that. May I, Dr. Joseph Finger? I think Mr. Meyer in uh, his statement, and I think Ms. Fraley didn't mention names, but I assume that's who she may be mentioning, Ms. Beeble. I, sometimes, you know, that old adage of we don't give people their roles as well, they're available to get them, uh, doesn't happen. And uh, Ms. Beeble has been someone who's just been a, um, a very quiet, steady but powerful force um, at, at Wauwatosa East, uh, an exemplary uh, teacher of English for many, many years. Um, and um, I think it says West, but I think it, it means meant, meant, it meant East. Um, and um, she will be sorely missed. It's one of, she's the type of teacher that uh, that highlights the fact that we don't honor educators the way we honor professional athletes or politicians or doctors, but if we honor teachers the way that we do those other professions, she would be on the news and she would be honored. And so um, she would be terribly embarrassed by the fact that we're even discussing her right now. Uh, so I will conclude this by just saying, thank you for your service. And I just also wanted to add, um, we are approving some summer school positions this evening, as well as um, some of the uh, pay increases that we wanted to um, provide as a board. I was wondering if we could get a um, status on summer school positions. Yeah, uh, how are we doing? I will do my best to use my uh, outside voice. Or thank you for uh, this team effort to go ahead and provide an update related to summer school. Um, summer school hiring uh, is is proceeding uh, very quickly. Um, uh, Ms. Gaffney in my office um, is uh, sending out offer letters um, and getting information from uh, uh, Stephen Oliver, who's heading up summer school. We do have a number of positions that are posted um, on we can our application site for summer school positions. I have yet to get an update from Mr. Oliver in terms of, you know, we are, we've done a lot to go ahead and, and make sure that we can be as competitive as possible, bringing in Wauwatosa staff to be our teachers of summer school. And I'll be able to share an update with you in terms of um, comparisons of internal staff versus external 
in an upcoming meeting. So perhaps, Ms. Munfo, I'll, I'll expand a little bit more. Maybe um, we're, we're not speaking of roses, uh, someone who deserves roses as well as uh, Dr. Marble. One stru structure that we put in place, and she's probably saying, what are you talking about? But one structure we put in place this year is that we provided a release for Mr. Oliver. He doesn't teach a full load. We release him so he can start planning for summer school. So he's been planning for summer school all year. And he's been meeting with uh, Dr. Marble and her team in academic performance the entire school year. So we're not in this, this, this mode of rushing and hurrying to get ready for summer school. Um, so I think the fact that we're bringing forth to you this evening the, the first of many waves of hires for summer school uh, is a testament to the pre-planning that Dr. Marble, the academic performance team, and, and Mr. Oliver, Mr. Stephen Oliver deserves a lot of credit for the pre-planning that they've been doing all year. Uh, I think one thing that we noticed last year was that it felt like it was a stop and start mode to summer school planning. And, and so thank you, Dr. Marble, and, and to your team that it feels more fluid. And, and as Ms. Zelazowski stated, that one of our goals is to try to confirm and to secure our teachers, well, those the teachers to teach in summer school. Thank you. Is there any community comment on this item? Dr. Chips, if I could just ask, I just wanted to ask about the college programs that are offered. Um, how many students do we have participating in those? I'll turn it over to Dr. Marvel. Um, <clears throat> so right now we have, um, we have one cohort of students at Wauwatosa East, and that includes um, a number of students from Wauwatosa West taking the, the Calculus 3 class in linear math. Um, and then the the other numbers, we, we really need to wait to see how many students actually complete the course. Um, so we will have an update at the end of the semester as to how many students actually completed the course, because those are the, that's what we actually end up paying for. Um, so we're getting into a pace and cadence of being able to have better record keeping of all of that um, and that was actually one of the meetings that we had today is how, what does that process look like um, so this is the first time that we've really had um, firm monitoring of the number of the students that are requesting dual enrollment classes um, because these are all the ones that they are requesting doesn't necessarily mean that they're all the ones that they're going to take um, but we want to make sure that we are bringing forward a proposal of of all of the classes that students are looking at, this is this is essentially um, what they're requesting, and then they will have to work with the universities to find out whether or not these the classes that they're looking to take will actually even fit into their schedule. So there's a lot more moving parts that come into um, whether or not the classes actually come to fruition. And how do students know about this opportunity? How is this made available to to our students? Absolutely. So um, our guidance counselors are aware of these opportunities. There was also a presentation that was sent forward by um, Mrs. Cindy Carter um, alerting uh alerting students of these opportunities. Have I say, do I say that we've mastered our communication of all this? Absolutely not. And we are continuing to explore in what ways do we bring this information forward to our students in a um, in an earlier fashion as well, not just for students that might be our juniors and seniors, but how do we start getting this in the hands of our middle school students to start um, proactively planning for their um, their path forward when they get into high school. So we um, that's part of our academic and career planning work that we are working through as well. Um, but we want to make sure that we um, we have we get more information to our students um, in a in a more timely fashion so that they know that these are available. Sure. And it sounds like as you're kind of starting to track data a little bit better, um, I'd like to see in the future just kind of the breakdown of demographics of our students that participate <coughs> in the programs just to make sure that they're equitable and accessible to all of our students. Absolutely. And this is also one of our um, one of the data points that we're measuring for milestone seven of our strategic plan. So it's definitely something that we're going to have from our tabs on moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. I wonder if student board member uh, Nolte would like to comment on the classes that he has taken. Zach, Daisy, have you taken any of these classes as well? 
Um, so I'm also I'm in the Calc three class. Um, it was it was presented to us and our Calc BC class, um, but I did, hadn't heard of it before then. So just the junior year. Um, but it's been a very fun class, I will say, and the teacher's amazing. Also, we have um, five kids from West too, and I don't think any of that. I don't think anyone in that class won't like pass it. I think it's, it's a really good experience, um, especially considering how many people complain about math um, to have such like a different teaching experience. I just want to add to that that um, part of the proposal this evening is to bring forward the class that um, Dylan is talking about to both West and East campuses next year. So rather than just having um, the class being offered at one campus, we have enough interest uh, of students that we want to bring it and have it accessible at both campuses. So that's very exciting. I would be remiss if I did. I'm sorry, Zach. My, my bad. Um, <laughs> I, I just I want to emphasize that Dr. Marble and I actually met with parents from Walatosa West who so they, they reached out to us and they set up a meeting with the two of us to ask why did their the children at Tulsa West have to consider going to Tulsa East for the course? And was there some way that we at the district level could make it work? where we could offer the course at both West and East. I just wanna thank those parents for reaching out to us and being collaborative with us and, and being direct with us. And I think the direct result is that now we're able to offer that, that service. Without that direct communication and the collaboration, I think it would have bogged down the process and maybe we would have missed an opportunity. I, I think Dr. Merbo and I are very grateful to those parents for directly communicating with us and collaborating with us in such a positive way. Sorry, Zach. Um, I didn't get an opportunity to uh, take the course in part uh, because uh, I didn't always have transport over to East. So it was great to hear that um, it'll be made accessible to West students as well. Um, it was just a conflict schedule for me, but I have a lot of friends who um, say that it's really uh, interesting and insightful and that they're really enjoying it. Um, and it was made uh, very clear in BC uh, as an option after completing BC calculus. So um, it is uh, uh, made available and clear to um, the students coming out of that course. So that's all I would have to say. And I'll just say final uh, uh, props to our own professors in that um, once you test out of AP, you can take other classes. So my son took, um, computer science at UWM. Um, and while he enjoyed the collegiate aspect of it and going to campus, uh, he thought our AP computer science was even better. Um, so I think one of the things we might need to look at too is that just because it's a college class, if it's an intro class, it doesn't mean that it's actually next level um, and something to think about. Thank you. I, um, I also wanted to add that um, our our students have to believe that they can take these courses and that they'll be successful at these courses. Um, and I know in the past that we've had um, we've had conversations with the student unions. We've even had students come um, to present and talk to the board about why maybe certain students are not. Um, thinking they can succeed or uh, offering suggestions with with how they can um, encourage their peers, um, be more confident in themselves. So I want to encourage all of that, um, you know, into the student body to come to the board, come to the administration, help us understand what we can do to help you succeed as a student and and take some of these classes, see yourself going to the places that you want to be and, um, and that you can do it. Now we'll go to public comment. Any comment on this item? Jamie, any comment online? No, there are no hands raised. Thank you all. Great conversation. Thank you all. Particularly as a parent whose child is about getting into that place where she may consider taking some of these courses. Ms. Colorado. 
Ms. Milfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoyk? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Thank you, and that agenda item passes. Next up is strategic goal four, high quality staff. Action to approve the 2023-24 administrative contract for Shannon Iscurido. Did I get that right? Uh, as principal of Madison Elementary School, effective July 1, 2023, for 221 days per year at an annual salary of $108,500. Mr. Phillips. Sure. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2023-24 administrative contract for Shannon Iscardo as principal of Madison Elementary School, effective July 1, 2023, for 221 days per year at an annual salary of 1085. And I so move. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, Ms. Olesowski. Good evening. I am very excited to share with you our recommendation uh, for the next principal at Madison Elementary School. Um, Ms. Izquierdo uh, had completed a rigorous um, application and selection process, interviewing with staff and families, administrators, uh, Dr. Means, as well as Ms. Willis. Um, she also got a chance to go ahead and visit the school, uh, talk with some students, um, and we are pleased to bring that recommendation forward this evening. I believe Ms. Izquierdo has a few uh, uh, sentiments you'd like to share. Awesome. Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm Shannon Iscardo. Um, thank you for having me here today, tonight. Um, I'm both excited and humbled um, at the opportunity to serve students and families at Wauwatosa. Um, I worked previously in Wauwatosa in a couple different positions, and I think some communication went out on Friday, and I had some of my um, connections reach out and say, I saw your name in this communication. I was very excited. So um, it was exciting to already kind of be a small part of the community. Um, I really look forward to building on the collective excellence um, and pursuing um, exceeding proficiency for all students here. So thank you again. Thank you and welcome. Board member comments or questions? I'll just say it was a pleasure to participate um, in these interview processes. Um, I am just thrilled that we are getting such amazing pools of candidates. Um, we had some really phenomenal people want to be in that position at Madison, and I am just thrilled to have met Shannon and had this opportunity to interview her. And I know that she's going to bring her passion for education and for students to Madison, and I look forward to that. Any community comment on this item? Jamie, any comment online? They're not hands raised. Outstanding. Um, please call the roll. Ms. Milfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Next on our agenda is recognition of district retirees. Ms. Fraley. The board would like to recognize the following retirees of the Wauwatosa School District. Joan Anderson Jurgen, Karen Ave, Patty Brillmeyer, Mary Kay Delaman, Eluteria Gonzalez Dobe, Deborah Hernde, Jean Hoffman, Nick Hughes, Mary Johnson, Terry Candle, Susan Merriman, Glenn Slonak, Gail Stamsta, Mary White, and Lisa Wynn. Um, congratulations to everyone. Ms. Elisowski or Dr. Means, I don't know if you have any. Um... Um, uh, today, we actually shared um, a save the date information for our annual recognition for retirees, as well as staff members who've completed 25 years of service in Wauwatosa. Please mark your calendars uh, for May 17th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, this year's celebration will take place at the Milwaukee County Zoo. Um, we are terribly grateful um, for the service provided by our retirees um, and wish them the best in this next chapter of their of their lives. Thank you. Thank you to everyone um, who are recognizing this evening and excited to celebrate uh, your contributions for, for several years, no doubt. Any board comments? Thank you. 
Thank you all very much. We move on to strategic goal number five, culture and climate. Action to approve additional safety measures and resources. Ms. Mufeld. Yes, thank you. It is recommended that the school board approve additional safety measures and resources, and I so move. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Wills. And we have a presentation this evening. Hello, we will be working off of the executive summary that is attached in board docs for tonight. I'm here with Laura Geisler, our school safety and security coordinator, and we have a few items that we wanted to bring in front of you tonight. When we presented in February on some quarter one behavior data, the question was posed about what else can we do around safety? And we heard that. We heard about it. We talked about it a lot with different stakeholder groups. And we really thought deeply about what might be we what might we be missing? Where are our gaps? What are we doing well? What else could we be doing? Um, and we put our heads together, and that really the product you, is resulted in what you have in front of you tonight. I'm going to move around a little bit in moving through the discussion and the presentation of this, and I just want to start really with the background in terms of this school year. Some things that have really been focused in on. Some are discipline related, but still keeping that distinction between what is discipline and what is safety in terms of school related activities that protect from subtle or overt instances of bullying, harassment, violence, and drug use, really grounding ourselves in that as we move through tonight's discussion. Um, certainly, we've done a lot of work around behavior and discipline with staff, all the way from discipline to proactive behavior planning. We've changed and leveraged our special education coordinators difference that supports more flexible educational um, plans while also working towards increasing their capacity as coordinators. We've increased security. We have our disciplinary framework. We've added different types of staff, um, deans especially, as well as specialist supervisors. We have our DEIA advocates. We've gone through threat assessment training that has been really great learning for our system as we move through each one of those this school year while supported by Ms. Geisler as well. She receives a lot of calls as teams move through those. We've had the internal safety committee that has been running as well as a couple months now of our external safety committee. We've created different secondary school expectations around culture, climate, behavior. We have the digital mapping occurring through the safety grant that Mrs. Geisler wrote, different mentoring services and partnerships that have been occurring uh, that increase the psychological safety of many of our students who need it the most. We are building alternative education options right now, and we've got a team with different project teams looking at alternative programs that we might be able to offer for students who aren't being, or their needs aren't being met in the traditional setting. We have a framework in the works for restorative practices, trauma-informed care, and positive behavioral interventions and support, which is strictly aligned to goal 3.1 in the strategic plan. We've also been refining our student support team structures. So certainly that helps students behavioral, ac behaviorally, academically, but also um, on a safety front as well. We've increased accessibility to Speak Up, Speak Out, our anonymous tip line, uh, as well as some advocacy last week in a press conference to um, urge the legislature to continue funding that. We've upgraded our beacon system, which is the technology system within GoGuardian that monitors students' online activity on our devices. So we have recently upgraded that to allow for other events beyond active self-harm alerts. So now we can receive alerts for other areas of safety and concern. And we're creating this summer a process around moving through those alerts. We've added signage to doors uh, with stickers and metal building signs around Wisconsin Statute 948.605, reinforcing that weapons, guns, and drugs are not allowed on school campuses. We've also received estimates for updating our security cameras to 4K. Um, ours are a little bit outdated, a little blurry when you're really trying to zoom in on certain incidents that occur. So that's one piece we want to make sure we take care of for safety. And our remaining school buildings under our old door lock systems, uh, that's in the works to upgrade those this summer in the technology department, along with our phones, uh, which will increase district safety features. And we are now starting weekly district safety team meetings. So those are all things that are in place, kind of in the works, uh, either completed or near kind of completion. We're also looking at data continually. So we look at our office discipline referrals. We look at significant incidents that occur in schools. Um, principals alert us when those happen and we keep track of those data. We look at the number of anonymous tips reported through Speak Up, Speak Out. I believe as of last week, we've had 13 as a system. So that's 13 incidents we were able to get ahead of and um, prevent something from happening. We also look at the number of harassment and bullying investigations. And those are data that we report at a federal level as well. That really brings me to 
the items we're bringing forward for you tonight. I want to be clear that this is not to supplement or supplant or in lieu of any action or any recommendations that might come out of our committee team meetings. Those are still really important avenues internally and externally. This is not um, going around that in any way. And we started the discussion on these items with our external safety committee, didn't have time to finish them and give them due diligence. We'll certainly bring them back uh, if they're approved tonight. Um, but I would, I would make sure that uh, those committees know as well that their work will continue uh, regardless of what is voted on this evening. These are mostly one-time costs you will see in here. You'll see there's some external support requested in terms of just the capacity of our current system to implement some of these strategies or some of these tasks. And we really are going to start with item number one, which is about MANT training. This is an organization that does different types of safety um, and evidence-based training, and they don't necessarily focus solely on schools, but schools is one of their specialty areas that they've crafted out evidence-based training. We are looking, with the deans being a brand new position in our system, in a role that comes to us with many different disciplines. We have a school counselor background, administration background, teaching background. We would like to guarantee a solid foundation of learning for them. If they were to go through this MAN training, they would really be receiving specific modules that then certify them as a trainer to teach others some of the content that they're learning. And this would fit nicely with Strategic Objective 3.1, which I just spoke to, because two of the modules are really about trauma-informed care, as well as positive behavioral supports. So it fits very nicely with the goals of this board around goal area three. And we're asking that the deans be trained in that two-day um, program and then they would we would create a structure as we are, we are teaming the division of people and family supports with the academic office quite regularly to structure out long-term professional learning needs for our system this would be a factor in that if our deans were able to be trained and they would also then have a common foundation they're drawing from in terms of how to approach situations relationships psychological and physical safety is a key piece of that as well as communication um, so they really focus in man about relationships and communication and that's really where the, their entry point and in terms of training. So we'll go through all the items and then certainly your questions at the end for what you might have on each of them. There is a national safety conference um, that I have had my eyes on for quite some time. It is through the National Association of School Resource Officers, NASRO. However, it is not specifically for school resource officers. They're certainly encouraged to go as well, and we would welcome um, the police department to send uh, some of our SROs as well if we're able to go. This is really an area to stay ahead of the curve in terms of best practices when it comes to all things school safety at a national level. So they would have keynote speakers, lots of different sessions. They do have concurrent SRO courses as well, which ours all have already taken. Um, so they would not need to go through the, the SRO course. But we're looking to send two district representatives to really build up our best practices, bring them back to our avenues that we have in our committees, as well as our district team to kind of supplement and complete our picture of school safety and what we are or are not doing and could be doing. Laura's gonna talk a little bit about the school safety and violent incident Violent Event Incident Management Training, which is Save IM. Okay, so this is um, a training that's ran through uh, the police, uh, retired police officer in Oak Creek, and this will allow us to collaborate with other districts, and it's very tabletop focused. So we'll learn in different ways on, with different people on different exercises, tabletop exercises, and it will be great for all of us, and then even like our communications director, and then our SROs and our police department would attend. Um, just a lot of hands-on learning and just not sitting through courses, just learning and experiences through others and the exercises that they'll present us. All right, one of our um, higher cost items, and this is actually an item, we've met with our secondary administrators around some of the items that we set several months ago for expectations around culture and climate. We've been revisiting that with our administration. And I left that meeting last week asking our administration, if you had one priority right now, for the last eight weeks of school around school safety, what would that be from your perspective as the leader of your buildings? All four of our leaders said after school activities. We have done some creative scheduling with student supervisors. However, that's not giving us necessarily the full reach of what we need for safety around athletic events or after school activities and clubs and sports. This, I want to be clear, is not a long-term solution. 
we would like to have after school security for the remainder of this year as well of all of as well of as well as all of next school year while we do a lot of these foundational pieces of school safety while we do the audit which i think i just skipped over but i'm going to go back to uh, it'll really allow us to make sure all the pieces are in place and then we would be able to slowly sort of remove that level of service um, as we continue to monitor how that is working. But again, I want to be clear, this is not something that we're, we would like to have a need for a year from now when we're back in front of you giving an update around school safety. The other piece, and Laura can talk a little bit about this, is an external safety audit and then subsequently a consultation on that audit. Well, this would be a way to bring it to me and look at all our buildings and look at brick and mortar, look at our culture, look at our passing times, um, look at our after school times, and just really give us an over a comprehensive look at everything that we need to look at in the building. Where what still gets the positive, what we're doing great on, and then things that we would want to improve on. Um, this is, you know, this is something there's companies, they we're kind of, we got a few different options. Um, kind of sorry, take an average of the, and just look at what we think is the best and is gonna give us the most comprehensive look at our buildings. That moves us to the final, but certainly equally important item is student and parent engagement and listening sessions. We would like avenues to lift student and parent voice into this conversation beyond the external committee that we have, beyond the podium or the microphone in front of the board but a very concentrated, well thought out, well planned listening and engagement sessions done externally from, from an agency who has expertise in this in terms of how to have equity of, of student voice in these conversations, how to elicit parents in a meaningful and genuine way that will get parents to the table and having these discussions. So we're really looking to lift that voice in our discussion. We feel it's been missing here in the system for a little while, and I think you've all heard it from parents in different ways. We want to give them a voice and an avenue for that. Which brings us to the cost. Certainly many of these items we could have routed through our budget process and kind of accounted for. We really wanted to package them for you, not only right after what we've sort of talked about has been going on all year, but really to put this picture together. Again, doesn't mean there won't be other recommendations coming out of committees, but you can see on the final page, the cost breakdown, which is totaling $206,000. Again, it's not budgeted currently, um, these items for next year. And we would ask the board to consider funding these and let us get working on these items. Uh, we welcome your questions. Well. I'll start. Um, I do have some questions um, around the, the man sure. training. Um, I want to start by saying I, I support it very much. I think, you know, having that dean position get that training and that information and kind of disseminate it throughout the school, whether it's to administrators or teachers is super important. But, you know, as we talk about safety, I think one thing that has been missing in the conversation is like the psychological safety of our students, right? And I think these parents' comments couldn't be more timely that some of our students don't feel psychologically safe going into buildings and it's something that I bring up often, right? So not just our black students, but our students with disabilities and our LGBTQIA students. So I wonder with this training, what type of like culturally responsive piece is there? What type of training is there around, you know, some of our most marginalized students? Because I think, you know, that needs to be a part, for me, that needs to be a part of the conversation. So I just, wonder how you vetted this program. How did you land on this one rather than, I mean, I don't know what programs are out there, but I just think of the unique situation of our students and even some of the students that face the most disciplinary actions being our black students. Like how are we incorporating that into this training? Sure, we landed on this one, not only because of the strong connection to the strategic plan in terms of the trauma-informed care in the positive behavioral support section, but also it really supplements nicely the work that our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Shonda Holland, is doing and some of the training that is in the works to feed into buildings going into next year through our DEIA advocates. So we felt like that was being strongly covered through the strategic plan in that area, and this wasn't redundant in any way. Um, this training really does cover a lot of pieces where they would embed more culturally sensitive practices when we're talking about trauma-informed care, when we're talking about PBIS. I haven't received it myself. Um, and again, they have lots of different chapters, they call them, or modules. We really selected the first five that seemed to meet 
the needs of, of, of our system right now based on other avenues of learning that are in the works from that strategic plan. And I appreciate that. I guess I would just like, you know, to know that there's either even some flexibility that if we're finding our deans aren't getting that cultural piece that they need that maybe we supplement it with something because I do yep. think when we talk about safety and we talk about this position as a dean who is to build relationships with these students like that is a super important piece. What we could do is just make sure we're circling back as a system or as a district with the deans. I know our director of continuous improvement Ms. Fodge has been meeting with them regularly. I've joined several of those meetings but this would be a really good opportunity to as soon as they're done with the training kind of elicit that feedback and see where the gaps still exist but I agree with you. Great. I guess I'll just go through then. Mm -hmm. um, the security officers, so how many are there? Are they just in the secondary buildings? Um, yeah, they would, we would have one in the secondary One in each secondary building. And what type of training do they receive around? I mean, are they, is it a security, you know, company that's used to dealing with students? Yeah, I think we would look at the existing security company we're using for the athletic events. Okay. And, uh, and that down and you know really explain to them what we're doing. we've built that relationship with that company since the season the football season and i think that if we sit down and we really discuss this is the kind of stuff we're looking for they're very accommodating to that i would also make sure this is not excusing other staff from being present right this is in addition to sure and then finally, um, the audit. So you talked a lot about looking at the buildings. Is that all buildings? You talked about passing times. So when these folks go in and look at like the elementary buildings as well and kind of the culture of all of those buildings. Yep, we would do all 14 buildings. And, and they, it, yep, go ahead. Does Sorry. it include the virtual academy at all? Um, we can, yeah, definitely we can. It's it's really to look at your security of the building and what's so happening. Like physical is that, yeah, physical and you know what's added to the physical, which would be the the people in the building. Sure. You just talked about that cultural piece. Yeah, like so, I just didn't know. That's looking at like passing time and what's happening in the lunchroom sure. or um, that after school period. Those are the things that they're really looking at. Okay, great. Those are all my questions. Thank you. It's really. Um, so similar to um, Ms. Willis about the MAMP training, so I think train the trainer programs can be wonderful and I think they can be somewhat problematic, especially given that we're talking about mindset shifts. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, given that you say you haven't been through the training before, like what are the, what are the things that we need to be putting in place to ensure that the deans are uh, positioned to do that train the trainer role? Because again, I, it's like a really specialized skill set. Right. I would say the first priority is their learning as deeds because it's new positions, grounding them in some foundational concepts. We would really be working closely with them to talk about the appropriateness and the pace and cadence of moving any kind of or dripping any kind of that learning into the schools throughout the school year. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but part part of our team would be having those discussions upon their conclusion of that training around what that looks like. That will be a, a collaboration with the academic office as our two divisions really work closely together as we plan learning. But you're right, there are certainly pitfalls of train the trainer models. I see that as a secondary benefit and the primary benefit initially is getting them getting our deans grounded in this content and in this learning that is nicely connected to the direction that the district and the board is going. Great. And then my second question is specific to, and this is where I like have to walk that fine line between management versus policy. Like one of the things I, I worry about sometimes when we're talking about DEI is like the, the theoretical, like, you know, I want to be a good white person or I want to be good to fill in the blank marginalized community. And that the the sort of the the PD that happens is very theoretical in nature versus application based, where it's like okay, scenario. Like I love Laura when you were talking about one of the other things of being very like table talk and like real situations and whatnot. Do you have a sense from the curriculum that it is application based and that the the sort of scenarios and experiences that the deans are going to be using to train others are really grounded in what teachers, assistants deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that the, I feel, I feel like a lot of times curriculum is old and outdated and it's like, you hear from teachers like, this isn't what kids are doing today. This is what kids were doing, you know, seven years ago. Does it feel, you know, when I think about adult learning, like rigorous, relevant, 
et cetera. So we've had a couple of people in our system who have in, in past districts received this training. Okay. Um, for example, our director of special education, mm -hmm. Stacey Clem, speaks really highly of this being an applicable and practical application mm -hmm. upon conclusion of this training. So based on the feedback I've received from her and in looking into it myself as we were kind of teaming around different options, I was confident that participants would leave feeling like they're able to move beyond the theoretical. Okay. And then my final question is, how are we going to actually measure if it does anything different for them? So other than feedback from our deans, which is important, I would fall back. And this is where it gets a little tricky when we talk about all our all of our activities tied to safety. I will continue going back to somewhat of this safety dashboard, if you will, around these pieces of information. Are our significant incidents reducing? Are our discipline referrals around endangering behavior, alcohol and drug use, those types of things? Are our anonymous tips? So those are the pieces we want to see move as a result of our collective safety work. As it relates to the training of MAT specifically, that will be more of a conversation or means of which we elicit from the deans themselves in terms of how they're able to apply, what they're seeing as the impact of that training. Um, so those are kind of the pieces, both anecdotally and hard data that we'll be looking at as we, we view progress in safety. Yeah, because one of the things I want to know is like, how do they feel after the training, but then how do they feel six months later, a year later? Like, does it sustain? Does it actually change the practice? Because we've all been guilty of going yeah. to a great conference and we practice whatever skill we learn for about you know, three weeks and then go back to what we're used to. Um, and so to that end on the, the when you were talking about 13, um, you mentioned that there have been 13 uses of the Speak Up, Speak Out. Correct. Can you give me a sense of comparatively, is that a lot? Is that a little? Should we be expecting to see it being used 100 times? I can only speak anecdotally on that as someone who helped launch it in another system, uh -huh. twice our size. From my perspective, that's low, which is okay. why we've we taken efforts to increase accessibility to it. We pushed it out to student devices, put it up on the taskbar. I mean, we we're trying to find every avenue to increase awareness of it. But from my perspective, it's low. Have we asked students? All about that student voice. Okay. Uh, it would be great to hear from our student reps, kind of their perspective yeah. of, and I know Zach, you spoke on it last <laughs> week as well. Right. <laughs> a special call out right. to our, our speaker. Um, I think one of the things that um, is uh, that would be very helpful is finding a structured time when students are actually um, led through um, an understanding of actually what the service is, what it provides, and how it can be useful. Um, in you know researching and learning about it for the purposes of the um, press conference, I came across a lot of people who had like, you know, had seen a poster but had never even considered what they might have used it for. Um, so whether that be an advisory or, you know, sometimes we have uh, slideshows in our third hour classes, something like that could be much more useful in actually giving students a structured time to learn about it instead of just, you know, sending them an email to look at by themselves or um, just something that they're, um, that shows up in the, the, bar at the bottom of their computer and they're like, well, what's that? And then they just ignore it for the rest of the time. Like if there was a way to give them um, plenty of time to get to know it and understand it, I think that could be um, a lot more effective in getting the word out to students about the service and how it can be useful day to day. Thank you. And certainly the, the Department of Justice is an excellent partner. They have a lot of prepared content to that end already that we could leverage um, and kind of create a pathway to make sure at the beginning of the year this is integrated as a resource that students are like really explicitly made aware of. Thank you. Um, I would say I didn't even know about it um, until I, I saw the like newsletter talking about SACS um, press conference, but I didn't even notice it on my Chromebook. Like I'm trying to picture the taskbar and I, I can't see it. Um, and I am also in link crew, so I might not see the advisory, so I might have missed the email, but I think probably the most effective way to get it out to students would be just one advisory lesson, like this is what we have as a resource, use it, and I think it would really help. Three things, three times, you can get three ways you can use it. All right, my final question is, so this is being presented tonight for the first time and we're being asked to vote for the first time which goes against what we've been trying to do in terms of present then vote 
I'm making the assumption that that's because you need approval to be able to bring in this additional uh, security through the remainder of the year. Is there anything else other than the security on this um, that would have to be approved tonight in order for it to be relevant, useful, et cetera? That's certainly the most timely one when it comes to safety. There are some scheduling concerns given summer and into August for some of the training pieces that we'd want to hold spots, um, whether it's the Save IM, the MANT training. So those, those are considerations as well. Um, the longer that we wait for those, the more likely we might not have spots available or we won't be able to schedule flexibly enough for everyone that needs to go to attend. Thank you. Thank you for this proposal. I support it. Uh, I wanted to add uh, the speak up, uh, speak up, speak out. Perhaps we could add that information to the orientations that we have at every school so that students and parents would be familiar with it and teachers as well. Um, <clears throat> since it's also for adults. Um, that would be very helpful. I, um, I'm very happy to see this proposal this evening. I'm wondering uh, on the training itself, if these uh, vendors will receive some of our data so that they can speak to real scenarios possibly um, that can help us you know be more relevant for us the audit will be very personalized so they will dig in and request our data i'm not sure about the save im but they have us coming with school specific information oh, we could. I could offer some specific scenarios through our district but there's going to be a collaboration of a lot of different districts yeah. yeah i met with the woman who runs it and she's very open she said it's just great training I do think it's just much more meaningful um, when you have some real examples. I mean, not specific yep. named examples, but situations that you can use. Because when I went through the DOJ training, it's clear that the SROs, the police departments, have different, you know, possi possibly different protocols that they would use that a school district mm -hmm. would not you know, would One not agree the, with in a certain situation. And I can't really elaborate more on that, but um, but it's true. And it's just the way, it's just the way that we work together, which is why we also have different um, checkpoints in place now for alignment. And, um, and so I don't know if you can speak to that. To, um, so specific examples, you oh, think she, that's yeah, doable? She, okay. I mean, she works in the school district, that the one of the, the women that helps organize the training. I can give an example. So in tabletop exercises, we may be able to very well personalize it with lived situations from Wauwatosa to bring that to life and to kind of bring in our own examples of safety concerns. Great, thank you. Um, and then as far as the, how do we know that we're raising the level of safety culture and belonging in our district. How do we know that as a board? How do we know that this is working? Um, I have understood that the administration plans to bring back reporting to us as a board every quarter. That's meaningful. Okay. I would like to keep bringing data in front of you that, I mean, certainly we'll have anecdotal information, right? And I could even tell you anecdotally, some of the meetings we've had with administration around safety feel a lot different now in terms of the urgency, um, their attention to it versus, you know, prior in the beginning of the school year, but we need to move beyond anecdotes and, and see the results in our data. Yeah, I, I think it's important um, that to, to be more frequent, to be able to adjust course if we need to and you know this area is a heavy lift i mean we're we're doing a lot in this area that may not be known by the greater community and even the parents following such an incident and how we we're responding and what did what actually did we do and how are we using that experience um positively in the future and there is a lot of work happening and, and that's part of why you're seeing some external reach out for support, not only for their expertise, but also just a capacity issue. We've even had some, you know, initial discussions around what that would look like here in terms of our capacity around Mrs. Geisler, myself, um, but all things that I would hope the audit also will, you know, as it's pretty thorough. There's different quotes and, and each of them are a little bit different, but 
Um, we need it to be able to unearth all of those types of things. Well, let's just be clear. So in 2018, the staff was trained to do assess safety assessments. And then subsequently they did internal safety assessments in 2018 and that co coincided with the referendum. But we did not have an external safety audit. Those are two very different things. And so what you have in this proposal, as Ms. Munfeld is lifting up, is a safety audit from an external party. That's very different than training our building and grounds team to look for how to check doors. They may have been trained in it. There are experts nationally that know what to look for and how to create a safety culture. And it's just not the physical component of things. Uh, it's the, the, the pathways of how children are dropped off at our elementary schools. It's the parking at schools. It's, the, it, it's so many different things that I don't think we've really done a deep dive in. Um, Ms. Munfel is absolutely correct, and we're going to talk about this more in policy soon. My goal is to have a quarterly data update to the board where there's also an opportunity for, you, for the board to have discussion on what you're receiving and what you're seeing in terms of data trends. Um, right now we're, we're doing, we're providing this on a, a semi-annual basis. I don't think that's enough. I think we have to do it on a quarterly basis in order for the board to demonstrate to the public that you're, you're monitoring um, this, this very important issue. We can't continue to say safety is our top priority and you're not looking at it more than only twice a year. We have to we have to increase it. And I think we have to create a space where you're discussing it in public. Um, and so Ms. Fraley, you're absolutely correct. This is a unique situation. We are asking you to vote on this this evening. The This is the former high school administrator and me, the former middle school principal and me. The spring season is the most uh, vulnerable time of the year with safety um, in that the doors are open and things are just more loose and um, the ability for young people to be in places that they shouldn't be in um, grows. The ability for a young person to say, oh, I'll get home maybe an hour later because there's more daylight and there isn't as much urgency urgency to go home because you have a beautiful evening like you have this evening. Typically then young people are in positions where they may make poor decisions. That's where the safety culture has to come into play. This is not um, the, the type of structure that we're, we're proposing to provide more oversight is not a long-term um, it's not a long-term solution, but I, I think I was, I was, I was surprised by the intensity in which our secondary principal said, no, we need this. This is something that as we look at the final eight weeks of the school year, we need help. We need help right away. So thank you. Yeah. And I did want to bring up that point that the last time we had any type of a building audit was over 10 years ago. And we did make changes to the buildings by relocating administrative offices um, and, and made a lot of um, those types of improvements at that time. So we haven't done an external safety audit of this nature in quite some time and it is needed. Um, and I also wanted to say that uh, raising the awareness as a board member, I would expect to see high levels of utilization in the anonymous tip line from all different parties. And I would also like to see more utilization of Care Solace and some of the other tools. And we should, um, and the educators should not be afraid of, of this. Um, we need to know what's happening. We need to know what's happening from the students. We need to know what's happening from the parents and guardians, from the staff in the schools. Um, any information is good information that we can act on and, um, and really lift up this level of safety awareness and culture in our district. Dr. Um, 
I have a few questions. I'm going to start with MANT training. Um, so uh, I was actually trained in MANT uh, many years ago uh, when I worked in an inpatient uh, psychiatric facility. Um, and I know we are not, I already asked this question to you, so I'll just clarify for everybody because I was trained in the physical restraint um, portion of MANT. Um, and my understanding is that we are not utilizing that portion of this training program. No, absolutely not. Not a direction we would want or need to go in. We have our nonviolent crisis intervention through Crisis Prevention Institute well established. Uh, we would we would not be going there. Perfect. Just clarifying for anybody else who might be familiar Thank with me. <laughs> um, is that training that that we have on there? Um, is that that expensive because it's train the trainer? Do you know what it is just to train those five folks um, in that? Just I'm I'm curious. I know Ms. Fraley, you had asked about you know this is a brand new program. Are there some things we want to do? really just to, I guess, see, is this the kind of training that our deans of students think is beneficial? Do they feel like this is something that they can use before we go into a train the trainer? Um, but again, I don't know what the cost breakdown is for training versus train the trainer training. The costs were clearly outlined on um, different quotes that they, and it really depends on what you're all leveraging from them in terms of chapters that they, they call. It really entails two full days in person and then uh, a couple hours online pre be in person sessions. Uh, I can't speak to their costing other than it being an evidence based kind of tried and true long standing um, program. But that is the price for five people. Okay. I mean, I guess, again, not to say I wouldn't vote yes for it tonight, but I just, I think it's something we should consider that maybe getting our deans of students trained first, just to do the training initially to see if it's something they want and, and like um, and feel like is beneficial before we kind of invest in this program and say, this is our program where we're going to put our whole district through. And, and, and actually, from my understanding, the system in which they're training it would be the same regardless of if they're going to take it and train others. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the NASRO conference, I don't know if I'm saying that right, the SRO conference. Um, Safety conference, not yes. NASRO conference. <laughs> right. Um, so do you feel like, because one of my, my biggest questions or concerns around this, and I know we're sending our district staff, um, but we are going to invite the SROs to do this, is, is do we feel like our SROs have the capacity for any additional programming? Because really conferences like this are meant to teach you about programs that you can bring back to your school and implement. And we just spent almost nine months negotiating our MOU do we really, I mean, is our, is our, are our SROs open to the idea of expanding the programming that they provide and would want to, you know, increase their capacity for learning new programs and bringing them back to our district? Laura will be able to speak a little bit better about maybe their perception, and I certainly don't want to speak for them. I can say that I believe a training like this, which is really the only conference, there aren't really local safety conferences within reach. I see this as a potential, community members had pointed out, right, potential pitfalls in the MOU or clarity they wanted around training. Mm -hmm. I see this as an opportunity to strengthen that and give us more clarity and direction uh, in best practice. But uh, maybe you can speak a little bit. Yeah, and I, I feel that they are always open to go to trainings and, you know, learn new things and bring it into the practice in the buildings. Okay. Um, that said, I would like to go regardless of if the SRO is yeah. able to come because I think we will benefit regardless of if SROs were to attend with us. Okay. Well, and so I'll just ask the question because I have some other specific kind of like program specific questions, but I'm just wondering how much of this is kind of like overlapping. I feel like these were, you know, whatever it was, five or so different programs that there seems to be overlap amongst them. And so if we're sending district staff to the SRO conference, are we getting something unique out of that conference that we wouldn't get if we didn't send you to that conference? I wouldn't see overlap in the items we presented, at least nothing that would be so repetitious that we would feel like it, it's of somewhat of a waste, if you will. I see a conference, and this is a year out, right? This is 2024, so we don't know what the keynote will be. We don't know what mm -hmm. those sessions, but like any conference, I see it a way, as a way to develop ourselves, bring learning back, understand what is what is being done that is research-based and, and gaining traction and working around safety. Um, 
and and how do we incorporate that again i see there's potential for strengthening some of our agreements that we have the mou um, but i don't necessarily believe there's much overlap in content with what we're presenting so um, Dr. Means, you were mentioning that we did not do an external safety audit before or during our our facilities referendum. That was yeah. not part of the process. Okay. Did our builders, is that something that is was sort of inherent as they built these new buildings? Is that something they incorporated, like having you know, double doors? The secure, and, yeah, the secure vestibules, um, the select on button. Okay. I think there was the internal, I think we did a lot with the internal safety assessments that our buildings and ground team provided. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we did a lot and I think we, we gained a lot of opportunities there, but mm -hmm. there's, there's still, there's something to having an external safety audit uh, that that I think we can profit from going forward. I think the other thing that the training, and I think the training was provided to our buildings and grounds team from the Wisconsin Safety Organization. So it, it was it was a very, I, I would say a very reputable um, process that we went through in 2018. Um, but I, I think that, that overall training also suggested that we should do it every five years. So we're at the five year mark. It, it is time for us to start some type of audit process again. Um, and, and things change. So I think looking at an external audit is, is the next logical step for us. Mr. Meyer, I didn't know if you were about to, you know you were. No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I still had, I wasn't no. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know, Mr. Meyer, if you had something about the, the building. Oh. Well, I, I assumed at the time that the architects um, incorporated state-of-the-art things at the time. Yeah. Which is, you know, dangerous seems to always find new ways to find us. So, right, right, right. Well, and so if the refer so the referendum passed in 2018, and then, so then obviously, I don't think that would be the start of our clock, though, because 2018, we were starting to meet with the community and talk about what the schools would look like when were the schools like built and opened because to me that's the start of the five-year clock i believe the audit the internal audits though were done prior prior 2017. to 2017-2018 but so the internal we, audits were on the old buildings not on the new buildings that we had that we have because the old buildings, I mean, the old Lincoln doesn't look anything like the new Lincoln. So my, I, we may differ on this, but my read is that we're at the five-year window, based off of what the information, the decisions made. The decisions made. They were implemented later, but they were at the five-year window up to the point that the audit occurred. I think you're both right. So I think the four buildings that have, were renovated, their window may have started as soon as they were open, right? Mm -hmm. But. Madison, I'm sure Shan is listening intently here. There are some issues that Madison probably still needs to address. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Madison uh, would attest to that. I, I think uh, Roosevelt would attest to there are some issues that they could address. I, I know recently at the safety committee level, we've talked about parking issues and, and what does that look like? So I think there are ongoing issues that we could really profit from having an external safety audit uh, guiding us and giving us counsel on what should our next steps be. Very similar to what we've had, what we've done with curriculum and with special education and all the different all the other audits we've done, we haven't done one of those from a school safety and climate perspective. Mm -hmm. And you think it makes sense to do the whole district at the same time, yeah. rather yes. than doing, yes. catching Roosevelt and Madison and other schools that weren't as renovated and doing them now and then. Yeah. I think we've been very episodic in terms of how we're implementing a lot of these different issues. So there's there's something called bullet resistant film that you can put on the, the, the doors, the windows of doors. There's nothing that is bulletproof, but there's something that can at least slow down the process. I, we are 
sometimes reactionary in identifying where do we have that film and where don't we have that film and where can, where should we put the film and do we have the film on all of our on, on every first floor window i mean those are the types of things that an audit's going to is going to yield and give us um that i think is that I'm looking forward to, or um, how many cameras do we need to upgrade our surveillance cameras? Do we need to upgrade to uh, 4K uh, quality? Or uh, one of the trends in school safety at this point in time now is: Do you is it the obligation of uh, of a K-12 school district to have the same type of security function that a college campus has? where you have, they call it an eye in the sky, where there's literally someone who is, who their, their responsibility in their job is to ensure that they're going through different frames and, and security um, cameras of each of the 14 uh, plus campuses of, of our, our facilities to ensure that someone's watching at all times. Those are, are, are things, I could go on. Uh, we don't have fire doors in our, 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 our high schools. What I mean by fire doors is, I'll show my, my, my vintage here. There used to be, when I was in high school, they, they would have gates that they would put up and they would block off certain portions of the high school and that gate would stop you. Well, that's a fire hazard. No, you can't do that. But there are ways that you can insert doors, and they call them fire doors, where you kind of close off certain portions of the building. We don't have those. And so by, by virtue of not having those doors, are we, are, is that a blind spot? The way that we lock our doors, do you have to go outside and lock the door a certain way? And then it, there's so many little things yeah. that we, we, there are experts nationally that they think about these things that we, I would ask that we do it in a very comprehensive way. Um, and and, and to, to Mr. Phil's point, the big item of vestibules and changing the way that offices look, that those are the big things. There's so many little things as I walk through our schools that I think we still have a chance to work on that does address the, the, the safety culture of our schools. May, may I please add something just real quick? Yes, okay. Dr. Hoyek, I paused it when Dr. Means was speaking, but about 90 seconds left for questions. The, the point that, that Dr. Means triggers in my head, sometimes technologies stay the same, but accepted practices get stronger. Yeah, and I and, and I'm I, I, yeah. I don't want to be short sighted, and and I'm not against this proposal, but I also know not that many months ago we had our our grounds people come and give us a like here's our ten year or five year plan, and I don't remember any of this being part of that discussion, and that was just a couple of months ago. So while I do want to be really intentional, I want to be really intentional and make sure that we're not just doing this piecemeal thing and just now we're adding an, a new part of our piecemeal plan and in another six months you're going to come back and say here's another new thing that we needed to put in there like i really want to be thoughtful about what do we need for our facilities and how is that all being wrapped into our budget because we need to be really thoughtful about the cost of all of this that's a great point all i would share with you is that that's an emerging in the world of k-12 education that's an emerging space that's an emerging space because in, in higher education, there's a true, so right now we're, we're one of the few districts that have a safety coordinator position. There are some school districts that they put the role of safety on the facilities team. In higher education, there's a safety team that they drive facilities. And so to your point, I think we're continuing to blend as a facilities, as a safety. I don't think we have made the pivot to ensure that safety is driving what facilities is doing. Right now, facilities is just waiting on someone to tell them what to do. And so when, when after uh, Mr. Pinion and Laura made their presentation to the board and board members came back to me and said, okay, so what do you need? Um, we want to make sure that there's no stone unturned. And when I went back to them, this is what emerged um, in that. So it's not an issue of we is being piecemealed. I think we haven't thought strategically of what's driving our work. Is it safety driving facilities or facilities driving safety? 
I have one final question and then one ask. Um, final question is around security. So what are we gonna do in the next 12 months to ensure that we don't need security the year after that, after school security? And then I'll put my plug in because I, I feel like I'm gonna get cut off and I'm not gonna get to put in my plug here, which is, um, can we please think about including all of our parents and students in our listening session around safety? Because it's we don't have safety issues just at the secondary level, they're yes, at the primary that level. That would be all, okay. all levels. Yeah. 100%. Okay. And then I would answer your question by saying all of the things I presented tonight are what we want to do well, have in place, monitor that data and reassessing and continually revising and looking at our student supervisors so that we have the capacity to manage and monitor our, our schools and our staff and our students. And our external safety committee is compromised of, uh, it does have some elementary parents on it, which is great. They just bring a different lane. Mm -hmm. yeah. May I make a suggestion to piggyback on what Dr. White just White just asked? Yes. The and I did have a phone call with Dr. Means trying to understand what we were doing here, and the idea of students in the schools after the building, after, students students in the buildings after classes end. Mm -hmm. We have so many extracurricular activities, and if the students were involved in those they would have a place to be active where they belong after school, but in the buildings. Mm -hmm. And one way to not need the, so much security is those students who aren't choosing to participate in something, who knows why, that we figure that out mm -hmm. so that they feel you know, an interest or mm -hmm. are we not offering the right programs? Do they feel like they don't belong? Do they feel like it's not for them because of, you know, I don't have a band instrument at home, you, you know, which mm -hmm. is all very, very valid. Or maybe I have a disability, so I really can't participate in some things when our advisors want everyone in their activities. So I throw that in there mm -hmm. as, as a strategy that we just don't say, we want to not need this in a year. Well, what's our strategy to not need it? And maybe that, I'm sure there's other strategies that we need, an ensemble of strategies for that would be one. Or now I plugged having an arts administrator to call homes to get the, the parents to know, or you know, or the guardians to know that we have programs. Okay, just throw right. my it's plug a culture in there. Issue, okay. though. Yeah. It, you know, I really, I agree. I think it's our culture that is struggling, and that's really the, the linchpin of all of this is if our culture was improved, we wouldn't be having students willing to be kicked out of school. Any final questions from the board on the side mm -hmm. one? So the just the last section, since nobody does anything about it, something I assumed we did fairly well is engaging students and parents in listening sessions. And so what I want to understand is like for the 10 Gs, what, what opportunity are we addressing that we don't possess? And then how will this permeate beyond this engagement to help us be better at other in other ways? Yeah, sure. Um, that is an estimate. We've reached out to different agencies, different individuals around that. We were looking for, we, we do a lot of really great in, in engagement yeah. in, in raising awareness of, of parent and student voice. However, not specifically for safety mm -hmm. and because of how important and how nuanced Dr. Means point of like just the brain that, you know, kind of notices all of those things that we're not trained as school professionals to notice. That's not how our brains work when we walk into a room. We want someone with that expertise as well as the expertise of how do you even go about eliciting equity of participation in something like this to Dr. Hoig's point around making sure all parents from all levels um, in our system are able to engage. Mm -hmm. I really would lean into their expertise in how they move through that process and how we then integrate recommendations from that with recommendations from the external audit. We are really well positioned with our external committee, our internal committee and a district safety team to take what is given to us from these external um, voices and get traction and, and movement with it. So the people that you're soliciting this advice from, they have an expertise in safety or in engagement or both? Both. Okay. 
So I just, is there an opportunity to take their work that they're doing through the safety lens and expand it to help us be better at doing this sort of thing in other areas? Or is it really just focused on, on the safety? I, I would say we, yes. Yeah, we can glean. Our, our, our idea right now is that maybe we should work with some school or some child psychologists mm -hmm. um, who understand how do you talk to parents versus talking to students and having them uh, be someone that's not part of the school system. And we have seen that young people kind of, they talk differently when it's not an administrator or a yeah. staff member of the district. And I think parents talk differently as well. And there's different lenses of what school safety and both physical and psychologically, what it looks like. Uh, I think the way that we capture that feedback and then can operationalize it is really helpful. I think the lens that people take it is different. So an administrator, some administrators have blind spots. Running focus groups is a skill. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we're in essence saying here, we want someone who has a really good skill and running a focus group and will get authentic feedback from people. Mm -hmm. So I, we heard it earlier tonight during the, the open comment section. How do people, do people psychologically feel safe? Are we, and I think having someone who has a skill in, in, in focus grouping and pulling that type of information out will be able to point out to us what, what our blind spots are, where we need to improve. Uh, I think sometimes when we are the ones who are running the focus groups, we're not as strong of listeners. Do we have, have we exhausted our internal expertise? Like I know there's a lot of people in our student services area, other areas that are like not administrative, not you know director levels that have expertise, or I would assume have we exhausted those just before we go out and spend money? I just want to make sure. I don't think we have. Okay. I don't think we have from a psychological safety yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, they certainly know that landscape, right? As a former school psych, I would be very interested. I do think as my team has come into student services and people and family supports, we have been very intentional with positions that we have placed for content leads, mental health leads, AODA leads, things like that. So we're really trying to pay more attention to that than ever has been before to that end of making sure we are maximizing their expertise. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Community comment in the room on this item. Please come up to the... Thank you, Lynn Worley, 10121 West Highwood Avenue, Wauwatosa. I just wanted to comment, I sent some questions to some board members earlier today, um, Mr. Pinion, not to you. I only got to see this, the, that Mant was on the agenda last night when I went to prepare. And so not knowing the program well, although, not knowing at all, though I work in that field, um, I wanted to learn more about what they would bring and why were they selected. Um, and so looking at only what they present of themselves online. So I don't have anything that you had and you reviewed, and I'm sure that you did a really good job reviewing it, um, but I still had some questions and much of it's been talked about here, but I wanted to add just a few more things um, question wise. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how many different of these kinds of programs you looked at, what, what were some of the other competitors um, that you considered um, I also want to say that their public presentation online is not really much about K-12, and I was able to fill out a form and get their two-page flyer about K-12, but I was particularly struck by their online presence, and um, Dr. Um, Ho talked about this idea of the, the restraint, and I'm glad to hear that isn't part of it, but I still think it influences, looking at the four things that they do. Um, there are four principles of working within schools. I still feel there's a lot of um, preparation for suspicion um, that uh, in the adult child relationship um, that made me a little concerned. Of course, I only have the, the bullet points they put up. Um, I also want to say the other point I wanted to raise before I run out of time is that did we exhaust not the, the district expertise, but the community expertise, the local, for instance, for instance um, WellPoint Network. Well, point that was used to be St. Emilian's. I did my trainings as a foster parent and trauma informed care through them, and they have a K 12 program training program. Um, 
and they know the community. Um, and I think that they would be much more likely, having been through some of their trainings, to really center um, how uh, the conflicts around race, class, and gender um, are impacting our school district. So, and they're not the only ones. I have a little, you know list of uh, some other ideas and possibilities, and I don't want to slow you down on it. I just want to make sure we're really getting a training that is going to um, give the deans the kind of support that they want. So. Um, and that they need. Um, and so I did have some hesitations and just working in the field, knowing that there's a lot of money in getting school districts to pay um, to train for safety. It's a big thing right now. A lot of people who weren't in that market before um, are jumping into that market. And I'm sure that you thought about that, um, but I just really want to keep that in our in our minds. Um, and I did feel some some hesitation. So even if it is a, ends up being this training, have we either used our local expertise or have local es experts help us work through the training? Um, I would say all of the major universities in the area have people who are working on this and more trauma informed and things like that. You could be drawing on them to look at those five chapters and say, is this what we really need? Thank you. Thank you. I make a response. Yep. Just a quick response. Um, please know this will not be the only training for deans as we look at professional learning. Uh, this is two days of, of many opportunities we have over the course of the year to build our, our personnel. Jamie, I don't think we have any other comments in the room, but I see we have a couple online. Yeah, we do, do have a couple of hands raised. The first is Deb Falk Palak. You have the microphone, please state your name and address. Hi, uh, Deb Falk Palak. I have a few comments regarding when we use the word all, um, can we make sure board members, please, can we make sure that this includes our students in our 18 to 21 program? If we're gonna be talking about safety and engagement, parent and student voices, we have to include all students. Um, I did ask administration why the DEIA, why there is no DEIA advocate assigned to the 18 to 21 program. And I know we can think beyond four walls. That was the answer given is that because these students do not, they're not assigned to a certain building, that that's why there's no DEI advocate. And that shouldn't be the case. There should be DEI advocates, especially, you know, Ms. Willis, I heard you say tonight, the groups, including those with disabilities, Mr. Meyer did as well, that we can't exclude or, or eliminate the voice of students and parents um, just because a student doesn't fit within one of the four walls. They're still in our system. And I believe we need these advocates for everyone. And I think that for me, that was even more pronounced after attending the wonderful panel that the school district put on with the city's all city read. And there were some staff there. There was at least one board member I saw there where I heard one of these kids or young adults in this 18 to 21 program and what she had said. And some of it came forward from the lady who spoke first tonight, uh, the, the member of the public, similar sorts of things. So we cannot just say we, we're not going to have a DEI advocate because a kid doesn't fit within a school building. If they're one of our kids, we need them. And I also think that this is a group, and, and Laura Geisler will know because, you know, I've been working with her this, this year trying to say for the kids in this um, 18 to 21 program who graduated from East and they're now at West, all of our safety notices continue to come from East. So if we get a text message, you know, my daughter hasn't been at East for two years now. She's at West or at Fisher. So these are things when we talk about safety, if we continue to exclude certain groups of people, we're going to exclude safety and engagement issues. So I'm urging you to have a DEI advocate assigned to this, watch the panel that the district and, um, and city put on. There was a strong self-advocate in this program who had some, some things to say that were concerning. And DEIA work should be applied to all children in our district, three years old up until 21. So thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we have another hand raised with just the initials SN. Please state your name and address. You have the microphone. Hi, my name is Sarah Nornberg. I am 2550 Normandy Lane. I just wanted to quick make a comment about the um, the school security for the secondary schools. While I'm very happy to hear that we are doing the safety audit, there are these little things like the door locks and things like that that should be looked at and examined. And I'm very happy to hear that we're going to do that across the district because after that shooting last or a couple of weeks ago, that left as many parents unnerved. That being said, when I think about this, um, I question the amount of money being spent on the security um, officers for after school. The ask is nearly a hundred thousand dollars, which is more, or which is half of the almost half of the total ask um, of two hundred six two hundred six thousand dollars. And we've had continued conversations around teacher salary. And um, how there was a meeting earlier in the winter and that our salary scale is not sustainable going forward. We've spent so much money adding deans and school supervisors and trying to understand why they can't handle that um, security after school. When I think about $100,000, that's like 1.5, almost 2.0 full-time uh, FTE of teacher salaries. And so I just wonder if that is um, well, I would urge you to rethink that. I think that is not our best use of money, especially when we know that we need to attract and retain high quality teaching staff. And we know that we are in a place where we won't be able to have the money to support those teacher salaries going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more hand raised. Julie Alexander, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Julie Alexander, 7224 West State Street, Unit 1A in Wauwatosa, 53213. Uh, it's been interesting listening to the presentation tonight. Um, I am concerned. Uh, I have some concerns about, um, about the additional uh, security officers that uh, are being proposed uh, and wondering if they actually have the training to really understand and deal with individuals with disabilities that might be in after school activities because um, there's a lot of security firms that don't have that disability training um, that really can understand students and some of those specific needs. So I'm concerned about that here. Uh, I uh, also am uh, uh, also supporting Deb Falk Palak's comments earlier. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more hands raised. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, any final, before we vote, uh, comments or questions from the board? Mr. Meyer. Well, first, I, I do well take and embrace the comments about, you know, for example, the, um, the working with um, special needs students after school with the security and such and other suggestions about how to tune this. And that said, um, we have seven board members and one superintendent and none of the seven board members are here day to day in an executive function running things. And we have particular problems in the district and we expect Dr. Means as our chief executive officer to solve them. And Dr. Means says he needs this. So any, I, like I said, I well hear all of the concerns and Dr. Means says he needs this. And at some point I have to say, um, not to blindly approve something, we've asked the questions, um, but he, um, he knows what's happening on a detailed day-to-day -day basis like no one else does. And so I, at some point we hire a superintendent and he says he has to have this for now. So I, I support him in his request. Thank you. Seeing no other board comments or questions, please call the roll. 
Ms. Mulefeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessa Banger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. And that item passes. Thank you all very much. And thank you for the very uh, detailed and thoughtful questions and conversation on that item. Uh, as we're adjusting to our next one, I've got a quick infomercial of sorts. Um, the Wauwatosa Rec is in the midst of doing a lot of hiring for our summer staff, uh, particularly anybody working in water, lifeguards, uh, rec program attendants, camp day counselors, t-ball, softball instructors. This is a great job for students coming back from college uh, or students who are uh, have high school students currently who are looking for different employment. So please, if you're watching or you have loved ones or you have people you can nudge to uh, work, these programs run because a lot of our youth uh, and other community members uh, participate um, in these summer employment opportunities. So uh, consider that as an option. Um, swimming lessons are good. Thank you to everybody working hard to make our post summer school that we talked about before and our summer programs go this summer. Um, next up is board governance. Uh, and it is a variety of different policies from the policy committee that are coming forward. Um, Ms. Willis. It is recommended that the school board approve revised or new policies, 2110 educational philosophy, 8390 animals on district property, 0143 authority of individual board members, 0143.1 public expression of board members, 0143.2 Board member information requests, 0144.3, conflict of interest, 0144.4, indemnification, 5500, student code of classroom conduct, 5516, student hazing, 5517, student anti harassment, 5517.01, bullying, 8462.01, threats of violence. 3362.01, threatening behavior towards staff members. 5610, suspension expulsion. 5610.01, alternative expulsion process. 5601, student discipline. And 5605, suspension expulsion of students with disabilities. And I so move. Thank you. May I have a second on this item? Second. Thank you, Ms. Freeland. Um, so I'll just remind everyone that this is a second reading. So all of these came before you. Um, the ones up front are around the bylaws and the educational philosophy came about a month ago. Um, and this is a second reading. And then we had the kind of the packaged um, discipline and student conduct that came before the special meeting. So we took uh, into account everyone's comments. Um, including the public, because we did get a lot of input from the public, um, both in attendance of the policy meeting and via email. So we'll kind of go over some of the key um, items that we changed. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, let us know. So we'll kind of start with the bylaws or the, the top ones. I think we'll break them down that way, if that makes sense to everyone. And then we'll go into the discipline. So Jenny, if you... Yeah, I'm happy to um, provide you with any feedback on some of these. Um, I'll run through them pretty quickly. So uh, bylaw 0143, authority of individual members, nobody had requested any changes, so there are no changes on that one. 0143.1, uh, public expression. Um, I don't believe there were any changes on that that anybody had requested either, so that is um, as we last discussed. 0143.2 information requests. Uh, we did clarify in that. I think that there was some, um, somebody had asked if we could please put in that this would, these would be in alignment with our strategic plan. So any information request should be in alignment with the strategic plan. So that has been added. Uh, 0144.3, conflict of interest. There are no changes. 0144.4, indemnification, no changes. And those are all of the bylaws that we looked at. And then I'll just add a couple. So the, the 2110, um, we added uh, the word celebrate. I think that was a 
suggestion made here in the boardroom. And then 8390, I know we talked about in length about the animals on district property and, and Dr. Floyd had followed up. So there were no changes since uh, you had last seen them. So we welcome any questions about those kind of first grouping of policies before we move down to the, the other batch. So then the other 10 are the policies that we looked at um, on March 23rd. Um, I will go through quickly the ones that we had no changes after our discussion because um, there were some that we didn't do anything with. Those are 5500 student code of classroom conduct, 5516 student hazing, 8462.01 threats of violence, 5610 suspension expulsion, and 5605 suspension expulsion in students with disabilities. Those, there were no requested changes made by this committee uh, or by this board. And so those look exactly the same as when you last saw them on March 23rd. Yes. So if I remember properly, there was a disconnect between the anti-harassment one and the other one where it had been um, struck through and it looks like that's, it was correct on this one and then it's the other one that we're gonna talk about. Yep, that was a yes. technical error with okay, Viola where it, we had it updated. So yep. our version was updated, but for but some reason, what it when we up. looked at it, like to go print it, it, it struck it. So everything, it. all the technical errors have been right. have been corrected. And, yes. and we'll go over that because we do have that victim statement. We have verified that that victim statement is in. Yeah, I think that was a big question you had, Ms. Newfeld. And so 5517 student anti-harassment, 5517.01 bullying, and 5516 all have student hazing all have the verified statement um, about victim support. We also added um, as an example of one of the things that you can get as a victim, we added um, GAL X or um, guardian ad litem. Yes, sorry, guardian ad litem. May I ask? I, I looked through the documents yeah. and I didn't see that. So my reading was um, inadequate. So where can you point that? What's support. under victim support? What's the number again? Uh, Fifty-five seventeen is one you can look at. Okay, um, I'm looking there now. I, I just didn't. I I know Dr. Means it's, mentioned something about the Madison School District about. It's on page five. Page five, Mr. Okay, Meyer, I'm that to helps. Get there. Sure, um, under victim support. Yeah, so we added, um, just as you're looking for it, we added um, examples of victim support that are accessible. Those included our guardian ad litem, community uh, counseling, and restorative justice. Page five. Page five out of 11 here. I'm, it's the same it statement. On. Okay. Right here. Under here, EG, guardian ad litem, community counseling, restorative justice. Okay. Okay, um, to assist the student. Okay. Oh, such as. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to offer a friendly amendment. Okay. To have it be state guardian ad litem trained. Because we aren't, I'm just trying to interpret this, so I'm mm -hmm. not trying to dictate. I'm, we aren't hiring a guardian ad litem to come in and, and guardian ad litem is particular to a, mm -hmm. a court proceeding. So these folks have particular training in handling, um, assessing for, for violence and best interests of. So we're not wanting <clears throat> someone to act as a guardian ad litem. We're wanting perhaps someone who's trained who has guardian ad litem training because of the skills that, that they might bring. So I, I don't think, I think it's a friendly amendment. I'm, it doesn't change what you're mm -hmm. trying to say. It, I'm trying to avoid unintended consequences mm -hmm. here. <clears throat> We're not high, we wouldn't be hiring an attorney to come in and act as a guardian ad litem. Um, we would be looking to include such a, a person with such training as one of the 
types of people who could come in and assist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I am referencing the document that we discussed. 5517, that's the one you're looking at right now? Yeah, that okay. was the document we discussed on the special board meeting. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And, and the proposal was the victim shall have a right to representation in all proceedings by an attorney with professional competence to practice as guardian ad litem for a minor in Wisconsin courts. Are you referencing Mr. Meyer's recommendation? Yes. Yeah, we, but we kind of tabled that discussion, but I mean, I'm glad to see it here. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand and reconcile Mr. Meyer's statement with what he presented to us earlier. I, if I may, may I address, mm -hmm. I think I think to, to have the guardian ad litem trained person as one of the possible resources addresses my suggestion if not to be dismissive of your suggestion or if you liked my earlier suggestion better than the one i'm accepting i i i try not to my phrase fall in love with my own words so it was a concept and if a concept triggers thinking that that's that's happy because we've triggered more thinking and that's what what this has done so I'm I'm fine with it. I'm, I'm but if Mrs. Mufeld, you are looking for something more, I certainly want to hear about it as well. No, I just want to understand the clarification because we we basically tabled this whole section. Oh. But I'm glad that the com, you know the committee's bringing it back now. I just I, I don't know how that is operationalized guardian at litem training versus an actual court appointed resource. I just don't understand that. Well, I've, I've done the training. Not that I want to do this here. I've done the training and, and a guardian ad litem in family court typically um, interviews um, the children, parents, um, mental health professionals, um, teachers, to make recommendations for um, placement orders. Mm -hmm. And those are, those people acquire skills in hearing the needs of the children and advocating in the best interests of the children without being the psychologist mm -hmm. or it, it's, it's one more tool that might be available. And if we try it and it doesn't work, then we've tried it and it doesn't work. Or maybe we, we might never try it, but just to say that that type of resource, well, I've just described with you what they do. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, they advocate in the best interest of the child, not advocating for what the child wants. <laughs> That's right. a different advocacy. So I just thought it kind of fit into this victim support mm -hmm. ensemble. Yes, Ms. Bailey. Um, I actually liked the guardian ad litem suggestion of Mr. Myers. The, the training. Last, the yes, training, the, right. the, at the last meeting, but also your, your piece here. I was just curious from a process question, given that Deola has already looked at this. So it doesn't sound like the, the suggestion that um, Mr. Myers is making changes anything, but I do just want to clarify for myself. Anything we add or change to this, will Neola not back it or will they back it? Remember how we had talked about yeah. how as soon as we start playing around with words, they start saying like, that's no longer our, you know, language. Yeah. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know that they've said like, this is the, how far you can go in making okay. changes. But they were good with but the they, current yes. language as well. Okay. Yes. So, so they made this change. Like... We made this change with Miola. Great. Um, it was incorporated and in part of what they felt like was appropriate. Great. Because then what I'm hearing, if I'm going back and forth between both sides here, is that um, to Mrs. Mufeld's point, um, this is now an option. This is something that folks would have access to. It's not saying something we would definitely do, but we're saying it's, Correct. and to Mr. Meyer's point, we're just sort of like putting some parameters around that phrase a little bit more. And so that doesn't sound, it, it feels like a happy medium to just add that in. I think so. 
Um, one of the other changes um, that we had a lot of discussion around was, if I can find it also in 5517, but we talked about um, having our staff, you know, should our staff be um, in the schools in the evenings or afternoons with students alone? the extra person. So that I believe was under J, which is on page, the bottom of page three. So we went back and forth with the wording on this. Um, we didn't want to be too restrictive and then start to get into a position where our teachers felt like we were questioning whether they were they were capable of making safe decisions, but um, or the activities had to be canceled. So what we settled on was this uh, about third sentence down. Staff members must be aware that being alone with a student may place that staff member and student into a questionable situation that should be carefully considered. Whenever possible, it is suggested that staff members consider meeting with students only when other students or staff or parents are also present to avoid the appearance, to avoid the appearance of impropriety. So that's kind of where we landed after a lot of discussion. Yeah, a lot of discussion around <laughs> because, you know, we talked about this financial yeah. cost. Well, right. and, yeah. you know, some of the affinity groups that currently meet after school with just one staff member, right? If a, if a teacher is going to help uh, tutor or help a student or two with an assignment right after school, right? There's a lot of, I think as an educator, I mean, I really try to look at it through that lens that we need to protect, you know, we need to respect them as professionals, but also, you know, have language that was strong enough to show that, you know, they understand what they're engaging in. Yeah. And then Mr. Meyer, you have one other question on this specific policy related to whether we could add socioeconomic status in um, as one of the areas of, of anti-harassment. I don't know if that was Mr. Meyer. No, it was, oh, I'm sorry. It was a community member for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was Okay, well, I, I had it noted anybody. as well. Yeah, <laughs> or, but but it might be somewhere else. So, however, yeah, it's okay. addressed. Just so long as it's addressed, that would I would yes. appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, it is in our bullying policy. So, mm -hmm. we did double check to make sure that that is in our anti-bullying policy. Mm -hmm. Um, in our anti-harassment policy, um, essentially this is written from federal law. So unfortunately, soci socioeconomic status is not a protected class right. under federal law. So if we wanted to be more um, direct about that specific topic, then we would want to create another policy related to that. But it will not, it cannot be part of this policy. So that's something we can consider as we move forward. But we did make sure it was in the anti-bullying policy. That sounds fine with me. So long, so long as it's just the the issue, the question is heard. Yes. That, that that it does happen. It's it's heartbreaking. Right. You know, if somebody's poor, they're poor, and they can't help it. And it does have bad out. I'll be sure you all know, right? Mm -hmm. So, just, I mean, if, if our point is to. Make sure we write stuff down in these policies, and if, I, I think in the bullying area, that's a, a good place. And uh, I thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Want to just quickly draw your attention to a couple of other changes that came out of our discussion under fifty six ten. 01 alternative expulsion process. Um, we did settle on by semester um, that we would have a um, an expulsion board or expulsion committee um, that would be designated by semester. And then we did add as well as a named alternative. So we will, that doesn't, the names of those folks does not have to go into this policy, but during board reorganization meeting, we would um, determine who would be the expulsion board for the next semester. And then one last was under 5601 student discipline. Under 3A, um, we did add um, that this data will be presented to the board at least semi-annually. And I know there was a discussion today by Mr. Pinion that they're hoping to do that quarterly, but at least it's designated that, that it will be at least twice a year by policy. 
So I think those were kind of the big changes that came up. And also 3C, I have noted for 5601 under 3C, so we had a lot of discussion around collecting data and kind of where that landed. And so it landed under 3C that um, teachers would be encouraged by their building administrators to be collecting accurate um, data as related to behavioral incidences. And then I just have one more note, uh, Dr. Hoyer, I think we missed. Um, as a, one last change that we made for 3362.01, we uh, had a community member who just pointed out that they'd like that statement about false uh, reporting to be added to that policy as well. So we had it in some of our other policies. So just that there could not be retaliation or intentionally making a false report um, when we talked about threatening behavior towards staff members. I think that concludes all of our updates. If there's any more questions or comments uh, on those last couple. Well, one, okay, I didn't see this, but someone else I'm acquainted with reading about the, the false um, accusation, anti-false <laughs> accusation claim, the idea of um, it, would it have a chilling effect on um, sexual assault victims and that's my question how is there is there a risk with I, I understand our motive with this language but is there an unintended consequence and i don't know i'm only honoring what someone with heartfelt observation mm -hmm. said to me so i you know i'm I have to hear what other people say, mm -hmm. and but but is it a hill to die on here? I'm asking you all with more. Well, I don't have any professional expertise in the area. If, if anyone with professional expertise to enlighten us on how we're okay with respect to that possible concern. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, that was part of yeah. the pol you know, as the, the yeah. was sort of the Neola. Um, policy as presented, but I think it's a really good point. Uh, um, to me, more of like the practice of what does this policy look like in practice is really in those administrative guidelines. And so I guess I would I would look to our administrators to make sure that we're being really thoughtful about how we are interpreting that specific um, sub subsection around um, false reporting because yes we would want to be right. very very careful that we would not right. be discouraging any student from reporting something even if they can't sort of prove it in the traditional sense um, but to feel like they can come to an administrator and still discuss their concerns you know a, a, a place like that an issue like that is where the interventionist for the guardian ad litem training would, would be, because they deal with that stuff. Yeah. That kind of stuff like, you know, discerning who's really on the level and who's not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as with all professions, mistakes are made, but that's their mission is to try to figure that stuff out. Yeah, so yeah. you, when you brought this up, it was a, it really sparked a lot of thought and conversation um, for us. And, and as we were going through and correcting some of the changes on these policies that came up in our discussion, we started talking about like, is our school district a district that needs a family advocate or a student advocate? Is that a, is that a role that we don't have right now that is part of both an inclusive culture and sense of belonging, but also something that protects our, yeah. our, our students who become victims in some way um, to feel like they have somebody in the building who is their advocate. So it's, I think it's something for us to continue to, to talk about and consider. Thank you. The only thing, sorry. The only thing I would add um, as I'm stepping away is I would also think there's a connection actually between several of these policies and speak up, speak out, mm -hmm. in that I think sometimes kids feel like in order to make an accusation through something like speak up, speak out, they have to know for sure something happened versus 
I think maybe this should be looked into, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is in and of itself not a false claim. Right. Um, and so I think to what Zach and, and Dylan were talking about earlier is like, they actually don't just need to know about the, the system. They need to know how to use it and how, you know, the number 13 just sounded really low to me because I would have expected that there would have been more just because speak of speak out is different than like, you know, tattletailing because it's an anonymous, um, you know, declaration or question that you're putting out there. So I would just encourage the board to think about how these things actually all work together as well. Um, so that kids, students understand them. I think it's a great, I think it's a great <laughs> question and thought because I agree 13 is a very low number considering the concerns that have come up in our schools this year. Um, I don't know, Mr. Pinnon, do you have thoughts about how we can make sure that our students feel safe and comfortable using an anonymous hotline or going to their teacher and saying, I have concerns because I heard this rumor or whatever, without it, without there being worry that they're going to be accused of falsely reporting something? It's really all, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. It's really all in the exposure in how we introduce it to them. So in my past system, we would see surges of use of speak up, speak out upon consistent con um, consistent delivery of lessons. So like when we first launched it, saw a wave mm -hmm. mid year through, we did a reminder in a lesson, saw a wave. So it's really about revisiting that using the resources speak up, speak out has four lessons. They're not long, they're brief. It is about bringing the awareness and in so still personalizing it to our system the individual school so that they know there are still trusted adults here. This is one pathway right. you can do it, but it's really just about being clear and in, in, in reminding students and making it visible. I only want to make this point, students, this is not telling on your friend. This is helping your friend be safe mm -hmm. and helping us all be safe. That was all we had. So that's all. Awesome. Uh, questions and comments from the board on any of the policies? I know we've been kind of going back and forth, but anything else before we go to public comment on this? Thank you all for the really thorough review of the updates. And I, I know you're moving through a lot of policy. And so thank you for your continued efforts on this. Uh, do we have any community comment in the room on this item? Seeing none, and Jamie, it looks like we have at least one hand up online. We do. Deb Falk Palak, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, thank you. Deb Falk Palak. I just wanted to point out something in the bullying and the harassment policies. I'm wondering if the language under the section for education and training should be similar. Uh, for example, one section, it refers to the district administrator. The other um, policy refers to the superintendent, but you'll see if, if you really look at those um, two policies and including hazing too, there is no section on education and training regarding hazing, but there's a statement, the last statement. So my suggestion is there should be some uniformity on those regarding education and training. And then because policy does drive practice, it would be wonderful for helping, you know, does the administration know what they're now going to need to be doing regarding these things with education and training? And how does that come back to the community and students um, on these policies? And then the last comment I had, and maybe Jessica and Jenny, you can help on this, but I was just trying to look through, there was one policy that required um, parental signature if you were under 18 and not if you were over 18 and maybe this isn't one for tonight because there's so many for tonight. So I was trying to look through that, but just keep in mind that we do have students who are 18 who have a guardian. Um, so those could be some of our seniors in high school with disabilities. It could be some of our 18 to 21 students. So if it's not in this packet tonight and maybe it's coming up in a future um, but I saw this somewhere and I just wanted to make that suggestion to expand the language to say 
if you are over 18 and have a guardian, you know, guardian needs to sign. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are no more hands raised. Great. Uh, any final board questions or comments? Seeing none. We'll just keeping track, we've got three board members, so this may be your last vote. Let's <laughs> call the vote. Ms. Mielfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoig? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. And that item passes. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. No. <laughs> I will not entertain that motion, Mr. Phelps. That's our last motion. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Um, Do we have community? Oh, yeah, we had community comment. Okay. We did. Uh, next up is recognition of departing board members. Um, the board would like to recognize our departing, departing board members and thank them for their many years of service and dedication to the school board. Tonight is the last regularly scheduled board meeting uh, for three of our, our colleagues, uh, Sharon Riefeld, uh, Leanne Fraley, and Michael Phillips. And I have a couple comments on each of them uh, and would invite certainly other board members um, who may have some comments as well. Um, Mr. Phillips. Digits. Um, thank you for your ongoing quiet wisdom, uh, your insightful questions, uh, particularly your thoughtful analysis of issues around operations and finance. Um, we had a conversation that I will probably never forget in front of McKinley at a groundbreaking ceremony um, about the importance of big picture organizational change, really utilizing the talents of staff. And we heard that your, your thoughts on that again tonight and really listening to the voices of, of the staff and colleagues uh, who are serving in our roles. Uh, you really always pay careful attention to the culture of the organization. I continue to learn a lot from you on all Mr. Perspectives on certainly on the board. Sharon Mufeld, you were always, it was always clear and continues to be how much you care, care deeply about the students of the district and you always operate with care, independence, and a focus on their well-being and success. Um, you've often provided very wise counsel to me on issues of governance, and I will really miss your accumulated experience as a board historian. Um, you've always been willing to share your perspective and thoughts and push, and I really appreciated that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fraley, uh, you were the first board member when I was appointed that reached out to me and said, we should have coffee. Um, and I remember you sharing a lot of thoughts on how to prepare for board meetings, how to ask questions, um, how to be um, both an advocate and to be a good listener. Um, and our conversations, whether it was on the legislative advisory panel, um, navigating COVID as uh, board president, vice president, that was super fun. Um, and your deep, deep knowledge of education as a field of K-12 education, your advocacy for kids and teachers, uh, I've always learned and grown from. And so I really wanna thank you uh, and let you know how much I appreciated your perspective uh, and your, your voice will be missed on our board. Um, with that, I wanna open it up to other any other comments board colleagues might want to have um, on anything this evening. Uh, we've got some plaques for each of you. I just wanted to give a collective thank you to all three of you for um, all the time and energy you put into uh, caring for the students of the school district. Um, because though uh, many of them uh, don't always know what goes on at the meetings, it uh, affects their everyday lives. And the three of you have done a lot to help improve the lives of those students. Um, and then Ms. Buefeld, I just wanted to say, um, you joined the board the year that I was born. <laughs> So I wanted to say thank you uh, for serving on it that whole time. And uh, it's a pleasure to get to um, uh, be here um, uh, and uh, to say thank you as a person uh, who has uh, uh, grown up in the district that you have helped uh, care for. Thank you. That's fun. Thank you. That's fun. Mr. Myers. Um, on the year you were born, Mrs. Bufeld cast one of the votes to overturn the closing of Wilson School. So, um, and now we have a brand new Wilson School. So um, the, um, so that was a, 
quite a significant vote. And it, it may have been one of your first votes, I think. One of them, it was the one of the first nights on, on the board. So um, Mrs. Mufeld has given nearly 20 years. She's been here 18 years. The year before she joined the board, she attended tantamount to every board meeting in that year. Um, and actually has, I'm sure, sacrificed a lot from your life. I mean, 20 years, tantamount to 20 years of service. It's not a, a period of service. It's whole chapters of your life that have gone into this. And your voice was always available to be the second to request a special meeting or an agenda item. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. I moved to Wauwatosa in 2014 because of the schools. This is why I came here. Um, and you are our schools. So thank you so much for all of your amazing leadership and in, um, in this community. I just want to say thank you too. I mean, as the, the newest school board member, I've learned so much from each and every one of you. Um, you all had coffee with me and got to get to know me and helped me acclimate to this board. And it's just been a pleasure working alongside you and doing the great things that we do for students. So thank you all for your service. Thank you, I appreciate it. And and honestly, the students' voices are, are just wonderful. And I, I mean, I remember your voice. I remember the notes students have written to me. I remember when, um, when students come up to me in high school and they say, thank you. I mean, they, they care. I care. I still care. I still will care as a community member after, you know, my service um, on the board is complete. But, um, but I wanted to, you know, especially thank um, my husband, Tim, my daughter, Sienna and Carmen, who have always supported me throughout this journey. And, uh, and I'm excited for uh, a new generation and the board to turn over. Um, I did just want to share one like blast from the past. So, <laughs> so I did bring this evening the election sign that I had <laughs> signed by all of Wauwatosa representing everyone in Wauwatosa, no matter what school you went to, where you live, these are the people that elected me to seat number six in 2005 and reelected me all of these years. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for these opportunities to serve you and I'm happy to continue to serve you again uh, as a very strong public advocate and work through many transitions, um, among them safety and legislative advocacy. So those are, you know, some of the projects I have been working on um, with you. And of course, I'm here for you um, whenever you need me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Karen's looking at me like, you know you wouldn't say something. I'll be quick because I know you'll do the shortest. So thank you as well to my family. My husband came to his first board meeting tonight. I usually make him stay at home. Um, but, you know, somebody asked me the other day if I regret doing this. Like, it's been a very rough couple of last couple of years. And I said to them, no, have I regretted it certain days? Yes. Um, but I actually have never regretted running for the board. And um, while, while we've had some challenges, I can count far more successes and look back and, you know, we were kidding around about the the East Lights and how I thought that was going to be the hardest vote that I would ever have to cast. Um, but I think about there weren't student school board members. That's like one of the best things that I would say came out of my time on the board. We did an amazing referendum. We, you know, we have fantastic teachers with the new comp model. There's, I just, in a time where I feel like the negative just finds its way bubbling to the top, we have to remind ourselves all of the incredible things that we have done um, over the past several years. Um, the most important thing being 
the hiring of Dr. Means um, and putting this district on a path um, where we can leverage all the amazing talent we have and tackle the hard challenges. Um, because, you know, even when we didn't get along, the thing I always said to people was, every single person really cares about kids and that um, that's our common goal. And again, it's been wonderful having student voices here because you are why we do this as a volunteer job. Um, it's not for the money. It's not <laughs> because we have extra time on our hands. It's so that you all have a, a great experience. So um, thank you for putting me in the seat. No, what everybody just said. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, what I would say, you know, we, I've, I've learned a lot from each and every one of you, different things from each and every one of you. And I want to also encourage our new board members to reach out to us while the knowledge is still there. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, so be a great place to have a sounding board to like understand how things work and things like that. Um, I encourage y'all to do that as well. So hopefully we've left us uh, at a better place than when we came. I feel like the, the board has a lot of good structure, a lot of good momentum, um, you know, to really work more efficiently. And so I just hope that everyone continues uh, the work. It's been an amazing journey. Thank you. Um, Ms. Willis is going to hand out some plaques if you'd like to take a look at it. If somebody wants to hold one up. Just because you <laughs> make sure we spelled your name right. <laughs> and thank you all. Um, for your commitment to kids and to the Walter Joseph schools. And my name's spelled right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. Thank you very much. We now have any final public comment on non agenda items this evening. Anyone in the room? Seeing none? <laughs> we have one online. <clears throat> Are you ready for online comments? Sorry. Yes. Deb Falk Palak, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, Deb Falk Palak. We couldn't see your plaques very well online, but um, <laughs> congratulations and thank you to the three of you. I wanted to also bring up, since Ms. Mielfeld brought up summer school earlier, I, I got some messages from parents during the meeting, and I want to make sure that we're considering summer school options for those students who are remaining in our school district beyond 12th grade. Uh, Dr. Means, you'll remember last year during some of your listening sessions, there was a parent who brought this up, and you were surprised that we didn't have these options. There's some rumor going on right now that there aren't going to be options this summer for this group of children or young adults that are staying in the district beyond 12th grade. So again, these would be our transition service students. Um, if that's true, if that information can be shared out, but I think there would be some advocacy around this um, since this um, was something that you know was brought up last summer. And if it's not continuing anymore? Can families be engaged and involved with students and parents to talk about this and why there would be a need for this group of young people to have opportunities as well? Thank you. Dr. Means, can you remind me again, when, when a parent has a question uh, about something like that, what's the best point of contact for them to go right to the administration to be able to get a quick answer? It's the best pathway, Dr. Chisholmanger. So right to administrators, that would be- So that, that administrator would be Ms. Stacy Klim, the Director of Special Education. Okay, so if anybody has got comments on that example, um, please reach out to Ms. Stacy Klim and she would be able to- uh, be Answer it immediately. Answer it immediately. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> do you all want to give the second? Sharon, do you want to give the second? Um, please call the roll. Ms. Mielfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? No. <laughs> yes. Dr. Hoyk? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? 